this morning hour of uh, public worship at St John's Presbyterian Church, Annerley. Just a general reminder um, of uh, circumstances under these new conditions. No tithes or offerings will be taken up during worship. However, containers so marked are available at the entrances in which to place your gifts. Secondly, there will not be a meet and greet by the preacher at the conclusion of the services. So immediately following the service, uh, please be seated and then please make use of both front and side doors to exit the church, noting social distancing requirements. And just finally, post-worship fellowship is encouraged whilst maintaining the social distancing protocol. However, morning tea uh, is not provided at this time. Just uh, regarding our church family, a copy. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation just prior to the call to worship. Thank you. worship our God this morning. The call to worship comes from the 118th Psalm and just the last couple of verses where the psalmist says, you are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. I give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Well, let's uh, respond to his word by bringing our adoration to him in prayer. Let's all pray. Almighty God, our great Father in heaven, as we are urged, we call upon your name because you have said that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we are those who have been saved. And now we call upon you to praise you and to worship you. Your temple was where your name was in ancient times. But now your people are the temple of God, your holy people, who are called by your holy name. And we call upon you today because you have said that if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves and pray that you would hear them. And we come to you in the name of Jesus because he has given us that name and the privileges that it affords us. There is nothing in and of us that merits any of the good things we have. So our Lord, we bow low in your presence to glorify you because Christ has merited favour with you for us, because he has opened that new and living way into your presence into the very throne room of God. How blessed are your people whose cries are open to your ear whose needs touch your concern, whose love is met with your own great and even greater love. We praise you for the wonder and the blessing, the grace of your presence among us in our meetings, and that you dwell among your people in peace and power, that your spirit, the very spirit of Jesus Christ, ministers to us, leading us and prompting us and teaching us in all things and especially in our prayers. 
So accept us today and all our offerings of worship. We bring to you because we bring them in the name of Jesus Christ, who has won all these things for us and who has taught us to pray. Amen. We're going to sing to God's praise from the Psalms. It's the 145th Psalm. O Lord, you are my God and King. chapter 15, verses 1 to 18. Verse 1. Now the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and said to him, Hear me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time Israel has been without the true God, without a teaching priest 
and without law. But when in their trouble they turned to the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found by them. And in those times there was no peace to the one who went out, nor to the one who came in, but great turmoil was on all the inhabitants of the lands. So nation was destroyed by nation, and city by city, for God troubled them with every adversity. But you, be strong, and do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage and removed the abominable idols from all the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he had taken in, uh, the mountains of Ephraim. And he restored the altar of the Lord that was before the festival of the Lord. Then he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and those who dwelt with them from Ephraim Manasseh and Simeon, for they came over to him in great numbers from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they gathered together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And they offered to the Lord at that time seven hundred bulls and seven thousand sheep from the spoil they had brought. Then they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. And whoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel was to be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. Then they took an oath before the Lord with a loud voice, with shouting and trumpets and ram's horns. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with all their soul, and he was found by them, and the Lord gave them rest all around. Also, he removed Maacha, the mother of Asa, the king, from being queen mother, because she had made an obscene image of Asherah, and Asa cut down her obscene image, then crushed and burned it by the brook Kidron. But the high places were not removed from Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was loyal all his days. He also brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's now take a moment to humble ourselves before God and confess our sins and the sins of the church here today. Let's all pray. O Lord our God, full of grace and mercy, even the most devout and most faithful and most effective of your servants will confess to some degree of sin regarding prayer. Few of any can say that they have prayed themselves out on any day, that they have fully met the demand of duty that's been upon them, that they have filled to their own satisfaction, much less yours, the time and completed the tasks without fault, without any lack of attention, without any intrusion of selfish or unworthy thoughts as they prayed. How many must confess with shame of far greater failures and even evils that come into our times of prayer or our absences of prayer that scar those times of prayer, whether private or public? How many cannot speak of hours of prayer even in a month, let alone a week, much less a day, as was so common of even the common people the previous centuries? So unconcerned are men today about the troubles of the church and the world. So thankless are we of all of your daily mercies. So derelict are we of all the pastoral and Christian responsibilities that are laid upon us in various ways and to various degrees. Even to those that they know and love, let alone those that they don't know and love, 
are we as your people failures at times in prayer? And what of the church, our God? Is not the prayer meeting the most, the worst attended meeting of the evangelical church? Is it not the one most littered with useless talk and unfruitful behaviour, about which men and women feel the least guilt for having so wasted precious time? Sometimes, our God, we know that it can even be a place for evil speaking of men and institutions. It is a ministry for others uh, in the minds of so many and not for themselves. In spite of the fact that the church gives, that the scriptures give examples of ordinary people, and not just leaders, gathering to seek your face. If it is true that we only do what we value, then we know that the wider church does not value prayer. She clearly thinks that she is adequate for the task, that her enemies are well within her own capabilities and capacities, and that above all, she does not need you at all, or at least for the most part, to carry on the work and the mission. So help us, our God, and save us from all manner of these kinds of sins that set us that beset us with regard to intercession and praise and confession. We know that it is a hard labour for which we must conscientiously set aside time and give effort, often that we don't want to give. We know that the flesh is weak, especially with regard to doing this, engaging this ministry. But in our case, we must confess sadly, so is the spirit weak. So give us more of the Holy Spirit each day until we find the strength in him to be able to engage the conflict in prayer, to face down in the wake of prayer our visible and especially our invisible enemies. Help us above all else to pray in the spirit that we may first conquer ourselves before we conquer our enemies in the task of prayer. And this we ask along with the forgiveness of all our many other sins in our Lord Jesus' precious name. Amen. Another psalm, uh, I waited for the Lord my God.
of 2 Kings in chapter 19. Second Kings chapter 19, verses 1 to 19. Verse 1. And so it was, when King Hezekiah heard it, that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Therefore lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah and Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid of the words which you have heard with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumour and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Then Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he heard that he had departed from Lachish. And the king heard concerning Terhaka, king of Ethiopia. Look, he has come out to make war with you. So he again sent messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, by utterly destroying them, and shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed, Gozan, and Haran, and Refseth, and the people of Eden, who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvim, Hena, and Ivor? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. And again, to God be all the glory. Amen. Let's take a moment now to meditate upon the goodness of God. Uh, for this coming week and for the opportunity to bring our offerings to him then and uh, this morning and then we shall come and we shall give thanks and pray.
Let's pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, as you have enriched us in so many ways, so we have given back to you something of those riches and do so again today. As you have been kind to us in Christ, so we seek to benefit the kingdom and your church by being kind to her in every way we can. We thank you especially for the gift and grace of prayer, for blessing us through the prayers of others, even our salvation from sin, for blessing others through our own prayers, uh, including our nation and our world, not just our family and our friends and our brothers and sisters in Christ. Pray that you'd use these our gifts for your glory and for the good and the growth of the kingdom of God, for we ask it in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing arguably one of the most popular uh, hymns of prayer from, the, from our hymn book. It's uh, 513, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Today we thank you for Robin Watson who has 
spent more than 20 years in what is now a lifetime pursuit of the translation of the language of one people group in West Africa, a country of 9 million people or thereabouts, a country now which has completely lost the rule of law, in which there is a, a murder and mayhem in many places, which the church is threatened by roving gangs of um, wild terrorists and uh, about which we hear nothing in the mainstream media. A country in which uh, our elderly brother, or elder brother, Ken Elliott, is still captive of Al-Qaeda, and for whom we pray daily, weekly, monthly, that uh, you might be pleased to maintain his witness to his captors and to the captives with him, and that you will be pleased to answer that long prayer of his family and of his fellow workers in the gospel and of all of us, that he might be brought home to see his family out of captivity, uh, and that you might also, at the same time, in the midst of his work, free his captors from their captivity to sin and darkness. We thank you for the work that Robin has been doing in the Hebrew language, studying the Old Testament and uh, related matters of history of the ancient Near East, which has meant so much to him. We do pray that you would equip him well for the task of the remainder of the translation of the Old Testament that he would be able to review all that he's done in this increased knowledge of the ancient Hebrew to be able to ensure that it is an accurate translation uh, for the Fulani people whom he loves and has served for these 20 years. We remember his malaria and other ailments that he has lived with the whole time, which has made his life so difficult and yet, um, which has, uh, and which has persisted in, in spite of uh, his uh, attempts to recover. Please give him grace to deal with these things and perhaps to find help with them in the days, months and years that lie ahead. We pray also this morning for the state government and Lord, we <coughs> pray above all else that you would, would, would be pleased to restrain this government from any further um, legislation which violates the sanctity of life. We do pray that you would bring to justice and to account those who have pursued uh, these awful pieces of legislation. We thank you for the news that the uh, opposition is um, is going to review the abortion laws, in particular those that parts of it which enable a child's life to be taken in the mother's womb even to the last minute, and that they will start to roll back some of the implications of this legislation to protect children, or at least to protect them more than they are currently. We find it hard to believe that people, especially a mother like Jackie Trad, a mother of two, could cheer the success of this legislation which would result in the death of children, infants in the womb. We do not understand this, Lord, but we do pray that the truth may come home to people like Mrs. Trad and others who've supported this wicked legislation. We continue to pray for wisdom for the Queensland Government as it faces the issues regarding the pandemic um, and that the good result that we have had through the medical officers of this state and the politicians of this state and uh, the national cabinet that this may continue in Queensland and that the outbreak in Victoria you might be pleased in your mercy not to allow to afflict us. We pray also our God for the opposition for Deborah Frecklington for the Pope people who are with her and we ask above all else in the wake of the disturbance in the last few weeks that there would be unity in that party and the, uh, the LNP so that they can perform their God-given function as the opposition, Her Majesty's opposition to the state government. Lord, we long, we thank you for good government throughout the decades, uh, more than a, a century of this country's life. We do pray that you, in your mercy you would continue to maintain it through the men and women who sit in our parliament on both sides of the benches. We pray now, our God, for your blessing upon the word as it comes to us on the subject of gathered prayer or corporate prayer, that you would help us to understand why you've given it and how we should approach it, and that your spirit might teach us good things, that we might grow in our usefulness in this and other ministries and in prayer in general. We ask it in our Lord Jesus' name. Amen. So the text this morning is just a portion of... Um, 
Acts 2.42, and it reads simply, and they continued steadfastly in the prayers. So it's part of the passage which speaks about a number of things they continued steadfastly in. But this morning we're looking just at the words, the prayers, in the Greek, or prayer in the, in the English. So in recent times I have addressed this matter of prayer, and I have described it as many have over the centuries, <clears throat> as the breath of faith. It is as critical to spiritual or religious life and health as breathing is to physical health. That analogy and its implications for life are as true of the church as a body as it is true for the soul of a single person. If a prayerless person is effectively dead spiritually, a prayerless church is likewise a corpse. There was a church in the Revelation, the book of the Revelation, called Sardis. And this is what the risen Christ had to say to it. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Failure to pray is not mentioned as one of the symptoms of the death of Sardis. But the condition of spiritual death has this as one of its common symptoms. A prayerless church, if not actually dead yet, is certainly very sick and it is awaiting its death. Conversely, when a church grows in its ministries, especially in corporate prayer, it is a mark of a healthy and a living church, and one that will get healthier and more alive with time. As we continue to look at the living church in Acts 2, 41-47, we are seeing now its inner life being revealed and portrayed. Here at least, it is a blessed and strong life if prayer is any measure. The text I have is, as I mentioned, and they continued steadfastly, or they devoted themselves to the prayer. And it is the prayer, not simply prayer, as we shall consider in a moment. I want to consider the mandate for corporate prayer and the model and then some essentials. And all of this, as always, with these great subjects, somewhat briefly. So our exhortation is one from the Apostle and it's simply to pray without ceasing and it's true of corporate prayer too. So let's talk about the divine mandate for corporate prayer today. The congregational life of prayer is a call of God. There are many calls, divine calls, to general prayer in Scripture and for many reasons but there are a few specific calls for congregations and groups of people to gather and to pray with each other. In Psalm 50:15, God exhorts his people to call upon him in their day of trouble. In 1 Samuel 12, 23, Samuel declares that prayerlessness is a sin against God. That God seeks the prayers of true worshippers, according to Jesus in John 4, 24 to 28. That God delights in the prayers of the righteous, according to Proverbs 15:8. The command to public worship in the second commandment is a command, in part at least, to pray. And lastly, we are called to explicitly pray at worship, uh, specifically for those who are in authority, according to 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. If God is the author of human language, then surely he expects us to speak with him. If he is the author of true discernment, he expects that we will praise him for his glory verbally. If God is the author of conscience, then surely we, he expects us to confess our sins to him. If he's the author of compassion, then surely he expects us to intercede for others. There is more than a divine mandate here. There is a divine imperative, a divine command, and woe unto us if we disobey him. Prayer is a duty, it is an obligation, it is a privilege, some would say it is a grace. And we insult God, we defy God, if we don't pray when he has made it possible for us to pray to him in spite of whatever sin and fault we have. If we would consider what our Lord had to say about gathered prayer, then we have to look no further than the Lord's Prayer. Here he not only bids us to pray in groups, but he teaches us to pray 
through the same desire in the, the disciples uh, who asked specifically at the time, and I quote, Lord, teach us to pray. Luke 11, verse 1 and following. So he instructed them in corporate prayer. And you can pick this up in the pronouns of the Lord's Prayer, which are like, which are like the word us. Give us, lead us, and deliver us. He taught us a model prayer, as it is rightly called, for gatherings of Christians to pray together. And his disciples later implored us to pray, for example, as in 1 Thessalonians 5.25, where Paul said, Brethren, pray for us. Gathering for prayer is the call of God. It is a general responsibility, but it is a call, especially during times of trouble. Remember the famous call to repentance from 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. It is a promise, but it gives the church, ancient or modern, a divine mandate to come to him and to pray even though there might have been sin or offence in the past. In fact, it is sin and failure that should drive us as one of many reasons to approach our God in prayer. Now, I mentioned that the translation here is the prayer and not simply prayer. And some scholars want to argue that this suggests that the early church, even by this time, had some kind of formal prayers for public worship in particular. However, I would rather suggest that it is that they had a formal commitment to prayer more than formal prayers at this point. So the apostles expressed themselves in exactly the same way in Acts 6.4 when they said that rather than serve the tables as diaconates for the hungry, that they would give themselves to the prayer and the word, I might add. Prayer was a formal part of the life and the ministry of the church and the wider church. Not just the leaders then had this great call. However, there is no doubt, as 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 tells us, that prayer was also a formal part of worship. Public prayers ought, therefore, to be an essential part of public worship. It is part of the ministry of prayer and what is the one voice of corporate prayer. Now, historically, expressions of corporate prayer have been a large part of public worship. There are, as you know, prayers of adoration, because God is worthy, more than anyone of praise. There should be prayers of confession, because we dare not approach a holy God without contrition and humility and confessing our sins to him. There ought to be intercession, because as we have heard, it is a sin against God not to pray for others, as Samuel said. We should always pray for the word which he brings through preachers, just as we should always thank God in our prayers. Even if you ignore the historical practice of the church, as most do today, the very person and the work of God demand all of these kinds of prayers when we gather to pay him the homage of worship. And yet what do we hear today? Well, we often get one or two prayers at the most in most modern services. Almost always there is clearly no preparation for the prayer said, said by the individual. They are ad hoc, disorganised, brief, of little substance, and even childish, not childlike in prayer. That's a different thing. These, like most other things in the modern service, focus on the people. Of all prayers, the prayers of public worship should be offered with the most care because not only do we dishonour God in our homage to him with these I don't care prayers, but we teach others to approach God with their also I don't care prayers. The true prayer intimates a sense of God's greatness and his majesty. And that should be reflected in all our prayers, not just the intimacy that we have with the Father in heaven. It is a divine call to a divinely ordained task, especially when in public. And even if we cannot speak lofty or deep prayers, they must at least be respectful, sincere and thoughtful. Well, let's move from the mandate, the divine mandate in prayer, to consider some of the historical examples of these 
corporate or gathered prayers. Our text says that they devoted themselves to the prayers. If we are looking for a model in anything, we have none better, of course, than the apostolic church in its most pristine form and expression. Yes, it was primitive in the sense that it was in transition from an old covenant practice to a new covenant practice, but still, in principle, its example is broadly useful today to our needs. So we see the church gathering in Jerusalem between the Ascension Day and the day of Pentecost. And this is what's recorded of it in Acts 1.41 about its prayer. And these continued, these all continued, with one accord, in prayer and supplication, with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So it was in the midst of that gathering for prayer that the great moment of the baptism of the church took place. The Holy Spirit was poured out in that great historical baptism by the Spirit in a similar way that the Spirit came down upon Christ in his water baptism. This is a remarkable event because it was the first of several where the corporate or communal prayer of the apostolic saints was honoured with a powerful visitation of God's Spirit. See, for example, Acts 4.31. You will remember when Peter was arrested and was facing execution and the church prayed in Acts 12.5 that the earth was shaken literally as with the first two incidents of the coming of the Spirit. And Peter, of course, was delivered. The church prayed and fasted in the book of Acts when a mission was to be set apart and when men were sent, for example, in Acts 13.3. In fact, in the 28 chapters of the book of Acts, there are 32 references to prayer taking place. The early church was a praying church and it set an example not only in zeal and in faithfulness, but also, of course, in extraordinary effectiveness, not surprisingly. The living church imitates the apostolic church in its faithfulness in gathering for prayer for the reasons that I have mentioned and for very good reasons such as the church knows that without him it can do nothing. John 15, 5. That's why it had to wait and to wait upon him in prayer in Jerusalem for 10 days before Pentecost when the power to do things in the spirit came. It also knows that if it doesn't ask, it simply will not have, as James warned in chapter 4, verse 2. The church that prays also knows that it has to pray because God alone is the source of all its life and all its effectiveness, so that un unless she prays acceptably to God, she will fail first, and then ultimately she will die. At least she generally understood this in the apostolic in later ages, especially in days when God moved mightily, not surprisingly. Now we need to take a look at the inner life of the gathering for, for prayer. And to do this we go back to that reference in Acts 14. As we move from the example and the mandate to look at a couple of the essentials for the prayer life of the living church. <coughs> Most of you will know um, that scripture records at least a half a dozen serious instances of prayer. Um, people in groups can make at least um, sorry I'll start, read that again most of you will know that scripture records at least a half a dozen serious hindrances to prayer hindrances people in groups can make at least a half a dozen mistakes I think the number is ten but I'll stick with six that can hinder prayer in other words our prayers may be orthodox they may be unified they may even be fervent but because of sin of some kind, God will not hear. Here are some of the examples of God rejecting the prayers of his people because of idolatry and injustice. In Jeremiah 14, 12, God said, When they fast, I won't hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by famine and by pestilence. The cause of God's of God's resistance to our prayers is of course a great subject on its own which I have dealt with in the past in a series of sermons on prayer but I want you to consider the apostolic model for example in terms of Acts 14, 14 again note the description of that fellowship at the time as we deal with one of, at least one of the hindrances to prayer these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication 
and with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And I emphasize the word one accord. In that phrase, one accord, uh, uh, we have something that should strike us. There is arguably no more important element in the acceptable prayer from a gathering of God's people today than to be in one accord. Albert Barnes has a very powerful description of the significance of those little words as follows. He said the words with one accord in the Greek are literally with one mind. The word denotes an enti the entire harmony of their views and feelings. There were no schisms, no divided interests, no discordant purposes. This is a beautiful picture of devotion and a specimen of what social worship ought now to be and a beautiful illustration of Psalm 133, verses 1 to 3. So they were, not they were not only obedient to the letter of their Saviour's command as he left them in the ascension to pray and to wait, but their hearts were with their minds in purpose as one. You would all know that there is a saying in politics which we've all heard before. It is often applied to the Queensland political parties and certainly in more farcical recent times of our one Prime Minister a year syndrome to both federal parties, Labor and LNP, namely that in politics disunity is death. And if that is true of earthly organisations like political parties and worse governments or oppositions, so that people sense their internal squabbles and toss them out of the next election or don't vote for them. How much truer is it of God who knows the heart and the mind of all his people in all his fellowships all the time? Disunity, a sense of discord, seen or unseen, public or private, will quench the spirit and rob the church of his power. The words with one accord or mind are vital to the health and power to the life and effectiveness of a body of God's people. There is therefore power in unity and not just peace. And that is why membership vows contain the promise to study, that is to work hard at, the peace of the congregation. That issue of disunity, of gossip, of factionalising, of mutual contempt was the poison that eventually cripples and kills works afflicted by it. Such churches never seem to recover, in spite of all of the heroic attempts of sacrificial pastors and families, of presbytery visitations, and of repeated and sometimes massive financial support. And the reason is simply that the Lord will not work and will never work while ever protagonists promote the disunity of uh, the church in defending their egos and their empires and assaulting others who challenge them and any other reasons for which disunity is sown. Therefore, if there is no other reason to be cautious about differences of opinion, about slights and criticisms, about worse things such as gossip and slander, it should be for the sake of the unity and the peace and, yes, the very power of the church. I remind you all again of one of the more crucial passages of the scriptures about this very matter from Ephesians 4, 3, 30 and 31, and I quote, Paul says to the Ephesians, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. The unity of the Spirit here is the very least that is necessary for the free flow of the work of the Holy Spirit in response to our corporate and individual prayers. In the Acts 1.14 and 2.41 we have the congregation spontaneously of one accord. Disunity is the dearth, if not the death, of the Spirit's influence among us. Every ugly, damaging, divisive comment that is even whispered is heard by the Spirit and affects his work neg negatively. And too much of it, and his work and his influence is completely gone. Woe unto those who utter spirit-quenching language. The greater the peace and the sense of one accord, the freer the spirit is to work in answer to the prayers of the saints. 
with all the hearts and to edify people through his preached and taught word. And one final point about the essential in peace and unity of the Spirit. Let's not forget that we are called also to pray in the Spirit. In Jude 1.20 and Ephesians 6.18, this is the language. And it is why we are urged to be filled with the Spirit in Ephesians 1.18 and to walk in the Spirit in Galatians 5.16. Remember, our bodies, like the bodies of our congregations, are the very temples of the Holy Spirit. What do we think happens if we fill those temples of ours with offensive attitudes and thoughts and words? It is like living in a filthy and unkept residence. Eventually it becomes unbearable and long before that unlivable to the Holy Spirit. He cannot work where hearts and minds are full of malice and enviness and bitterness and pride or worse, even hatred. The house must be clean for the work of maintaining the life through the prayers of the saints and the work of the Spirit. So unity and peace, along with holiness of life, which is how we are filled with the Spirit in part, generally are the only environment in which the Spirit is willing to work effectively. And we do well to cultivate such a Spirit and such a purity in our congregational life and families. We do well to remember that, mem that, mem that membership promise to study the peace of the church. It is an essential for effective corporate prayer. And in the early church, it was there to extraordinary effect. The Lord added to them daily those who were being saved, says verse 47, in the wake of that unity of prayer. Now before I conclude, the corporate prayer meeting and all that's associated with it, like the corporate worship service, is a gathering of God's people before the very throne of grace. The throne of grace, which is for those, uh, the throne, it's that throne of grace, which is for those not redeemed, a throne of terrifying judgment, was made this throne of grace and place of help for us by Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Whatever you may think prayer may be, or may be for, or may do, it is fundamentally a privilege that has been earned for all of you here today and us through his redemptive suffering and atonement on Calvary. Calvary, in making heaven open us, open up to us, therefore compels us to access it. <coughs> we need forgiveness. We can draw near with great confidence. Boldness, as, is, as it is translated in Hebrews 4.16, and especially when we come as many people with one voice from minds of one accord. He died to make us one, and he ever lives to receive our intercessions and to intercede for us as his people. I would like to conclude now by making, uh, taking two quotes from great servants of God in church history on this subject of the effective corporate prayer meeting in public worship when the church prays together. The first quote is one from the life of the famous 19th century English Baptist preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I have used this in part in the past, but today I want to read a larger portion because it is from part one of his autobiography, which is subtitled The Early Years. Mr. Spurgeon reflects on his prayer meetings at his church as follows, and I quote, When I came to New Park Street Chapel, it was but a mere handful of people to whom I first preached. And yet I can never forget how earnestly they prayed. Sometimes they seemed to plead as though they could really see the angel of the covenant present with them, as if they must have the blessing from him. More than once we were all so awestruck with the solemnity of the meeting that you sat there silent for some moments while the Lord's power appeared to overshadow us. And all I could do on such occasion was to pronounce the benediction and say, Dear friends, you have had the Spirit of God here very manifestly tonight. Let us go home and take care not to lose his gracious influences. And then down came the blessing, and the house was filled with hearers, and many souls were saved. Spurgeon went on, he said, You had prayer meetings in New Park Street that moved your very souls. Every man seemed to be like a crusader besieging the New Jerusalem, each one appeared determined to storm the celestial city by the might of intercession 
And soon the blessing came upon us in such abundance that you had not room to even receive it. I always give all glory to God, but I do not forget that he gave me the privilege of ministering from the first to a praying people. And the second and final quote comes from Alexander McLaren from his expositions on these very words in Acts 2.42. Our text says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching, no doubt, but also steadfastly in prayer. I urge you to try to make this picture of the Pentecostal converts the ideal of your own lives and to do your best to help forward the time when it shall be the reality in this church and in every other society of professing Christians. Unquote. And so, to God be all the glory, wherever it is. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, as we have been reminded again of the wonder of just one of the graces that has been given to the church, the grace of gathering to pray together, we thank you for this uh, reminder of its wonders and perhaps for some an insight to it for the first time. We acknowledge that the church has always been most effective in times of much prayerfulness, especially when your people have gathered for prayer. We thank you for the times of revival in the past, to which I could have referred and given many examples, where when the Spirit moved, God's people came in vast numbers to gather to pray to seek your mercy. And they came because they knew you were at work and they wanted to see that work continue and even increase. And so we pray, our God, for each one of us here today that you would help us to redouble our efforts to be diligent and faithful each day in our personal prayers, to build up our discipline and our routine so that we can measure our prayers at the end of the week in hours and not in terms of minutes that we can extend that as we build our understanding and our appreciation of the call that we have been given to pray. And as we look around us to see all the need here and overseas and in our families and in, in the church and in our local congregation. Lift our eyes to see the potential for all of this that comes uh, through the peace of the church, the unity of the church, that ultimately results in the power of the church, without which, of course, we dwindle and we die. Fill us with your spirit, we pray. Help us to ask for him every day that we might do all that we do in his strength and his strength alone, and especially that we might pray in the spirit. For we ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen. We're going to sing now, um, Come my soul, approach God's throne.
threefold. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.